Welcome to Technip FMC Tech Talk, where experts from around the company take you on a journey into various industry topics, covering common trends and what's coming next. My name is David Kay, and today we're going to talk about subsea flow assurance solutions, and specifically the subsea electrically trace heated pipe and pipe. Now, if we consider a typical subsea tieback, we have a number of subsea wells, one or more subsea manifolds, a number of flow lines and an umbilical which links back to a host facility. The flow lines include production flow lines which carry the produced fluids from the reservoir back to the facility. There are a number of technical challenges in the design of these flow lines, one of which is flow assurance and the need to keep the temperature of the produced fluids warm enough before they arrive at the host. If not, then we have a number of concerns. One of the main ones is hydrate formation. A hydrate is an ice-like substance which forms from the hydrocarbons and the water which is present inside the flow line. A hydrate forms under conditions of high pressure and low temperature. It's solid and can block or plug the pipeline completely, which can prevent any production from the subsea field. Another concern is wax deposition. A wax forms around the inside wall of the flow line at low temperature. A wax doesn't plug the pipeline, but what it can do is it can reduce the effective bore area or flowing area of the pipeline, and in turn can have a detrimental effect on the production from the field. These challenges are well known in the industry, but the challenges are becoming more and more important as the industry moves to subsea tiebacks, which are located in deeper water or longer distances away from the host facility. The pipeline industry has developed techniques to deal with these flow assurance requirements. Essentially, they are to insulate the pipeline and in turn, obviously, to keep the fluids inside the pipe warm. The most common form is a wet insulation coating. Now this is an insulation coating on the outside of the pipeline. It functions in the ambient seawater environment. It must be designed for low conduction. It must be designed to withstand the operating temperature of the pipeline and also to withstand the external seawater pressure outside the pipe. We measure the level of insulation using something known as the overall heat transfer coefficient or OHTC. For a good thick wet insulation coating we can achieve an OHTC down to around 3 watts per square meter Kelvin where a lower figure is a better level of insulation. Now this is a good level of insulation but it may not be enough for the field development's requirements. If so, then we go to another solution known as the pipe in pipe. Now, as the name suggests, this is one pipe inside another one. The inside pipe carries the flow. The outside pipe forms an annulus between the two pipes, which is dry and kept at atmospheric pressure. We can then install insulation material into the annulus, material which is very highly insulating and would not be suitable for the ambient seawater conditions outside the pipe. We also install a number of centralizers in the system which keep the two pipes concentric and prevent the insulation material from being compressed during installation or during service. This type of system can achieve very good levels of insulation down to an OHTC of the order of one watts per square meter Kelvin. Now for very demanding field development applications, this may not be enough. In which case we turn then to active heating solutions, where obviously what we're intending to do here is to heat the pipeline in order to maintain the temperatures of the produced fluids. And this is different from wet insulation and pipe in pipe systems, which use a more passive insulation approach. The earliest forms of active heating used hot water circulation where hot water was circulated around the pipeline, either in the annulus of either a pipe in pipe system or a bundle system. We also have direct, direct electrical heating, 
where a current is passed through the pipe and passes back in the return circuit via a cable strap to the outside of the pipeline. The current passing through the pipe warms up the pipe, which in turn warms up the fluids. The other solution, and the one which I want to talk about more today, is electrical trace heating. Now, a trace heating cable is an electrical cable. Current passes through the cable and the cable warms up. If the cable is then attached to the pipeline, then the cable will warm up the pipe and in turn warm up the fluids inside. This technology is proven and is used onshore, but is only recently starting to be used for subsea pipeline heating applications. The way in which we apply it is using the electrically trace heated or ETH pipe and pipe. Now this is largely a standard pipe and pipe system. We have the inner pipe, we have the outer pipe, we have the passive insulation material and centralizers. But the ETH pipe and pipe also includes a number of trace heating cables these are wrapped around the inner pipe in a helical configuration. The cables are three-phase cables, so that each cable has three different conductors connected in a three-phase circuit. And we can also connect uh, multiple cables around the pipe in order to give a level of redundancy to ensure that the system functions during the life of the pipeline. The cables are attached next to the inner pipe under the passive insulation as the cables warm up when they're energised, the insulation therefore ensures that all the heat goes into the inner pipe and into the fluids inside. And this provides a very effective and very efficient way of heating the pipeline. We also have the op option to install optical fibres against the pipe. These are also wrapped helically around the inner pipe under the insulation material. The purpose of the fibre is to measure the temperature in the inner pipe and therefore with a combination of temperature measurement and active heating, then the operator can control the system and ensure that the temperature never drops into the range where there is a risk of hydrate or wax formation. The system is connected to a power supply, usually at the topside's host facility. There's a power supply, a control and monitoring unit. We also have a topside's umbilical termination assembly where the power supply then runs from there down via an umbilical to a subsea umbilical termination assembly located on the seabed. This is then connected to the pipeline using a number of flying leads. The flying leads connect to a um, termination assembly and specifically to a number of penetrators, which are critical components which provide the electrical continuity into the dry annulus of the pipe and pipe. The cables then run along the pipe and pipe to the far end where the three phase cables are then connected together using a, a star point system. This is one of the big advantages of the system which it means that we only need an electrical connection at one end, usually the host facility end where the termination assembly is located. The system is engineered for installation using the real lay method. Now, relay is a widely used and proven method for installing subsea pipelines. The pipeline is fabricated onshore to spool base into stalks, which are typically of one kilometre length. The insulation vessel then comes to the spool base. The stalks are welded together and are spooled onto one or more reels on the insulation vessel. The vessel then transits offshore and the pipeline is installed by unspooling from the reels down to the seabed. There are two big advantages of real installation. One is that the fabrication is performed onshore, away from the vessel critical path, which gives us the opportunity to perform high quality welding, inspection, assembly and testing. When we then go offshore, then the installation from the real vessel is fast, is much quicker than other installation methods, which minimizes the time of the vessel and the cost of what is an expensive installation asset. Now, both advantages are ideal for ETH pipe and pipe. The ETH pipe and pipe is complex and therefore the fabrication work is complex. We can do this onshore off the vessel critical path. When we then go offshore, then the installation of the ETH pipe and pipe is very similar to that for a conventional pipe and pipe system, except for some additional effort required at each end because of the electrical connections. So this methodology is ideally suited to the ETH pipe and pipe system. The construction at the spool base 
starts by first welding and testing stalks of inner pipe and outer pipe. We then wind the cables around the inner pipe, we attach the insulation material in the centralizers, and then we insert the inner pipe into the outer pipe. This is done in steps, typically four meters at a time. The cables are attached to the inner pipe using a cable armoring machine. We then attach the insulation material in the centralizers manually, and then the inner pipe is then inserted into the outer pipe using a hydraulic push frame. The process continues over and over again until we've fabricated a stalk, at which point then we can test the heating and the fiber optic cables to confirm their function and confirm their integrity. The insulation vessel will then come to the spool base. The stalks are then welded together, which includes connection of the cables, and then the system is spooled onto the vessel, which then transits to site for installation. Now, Technip FMC has installed two ETH pipe in pipe systems to date. The first of these was for the Total Islay project in the UK sector of the North Sea, installed some time ago back in 2011. Now, this was a small ETH pipe in pipe. It was a six inch inner pipe inside a 12 inch outer pipe, six kilometers long and installed in a little over 100 meters water depth. The cables were related to one kilovolt phase voltage. The system was essentially installed as a technology demonstrator. Active heating was not required for production from the ILA field, but the installation of the system allowed the operator to confirm that the system functioned as intended and provided a reliable and effective means of active heating by testing both at installation and also during the early years of production from the field. The second system which we installed was for Neptune Energy for the Fenya field located in the Norwegian Sea. Now this was a much larger ETH pipe in pipe system, what we refer to as our second generation ETH pipe in pipe. It was a 12 inch inner pipe inside an 18 inch outer pipe. The length was 37 kilometers, which is the longest ETH pipe in pipe installed sub C to date in the world. The cables were rated to higher voltage, what we call a medium voltage rating of 3.8 kilovolts phase voltage. The system is essential for production from the Fenya field. And as a consequence, the project included much time and effort to confirm the integrity of the system and to confirm that the system could provide a reliable and effective means of active heating over the full 25 year of the Fenya expected production life. The pipeline was installed over the summers of 2020 and 2021. The pipeline will then be connected to the Topside's host facilities later over the winter of 2021-2022 and will be commissioned and then put into service. It's a great achievement for us to have installed this system and we look forward to its service and we look forward to Venya demonstrating the suitability of this technologies for future very aggressive field development applications. So that's it for this tech talk. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please give the video a thumbs up and also please subscribe to our Tech Talk communications for future releases. Thanks very much for tuning in.